you know, our hope is your hope, my hope, everyone's hope is that there's going to be another great awakening. My fear is that some of that is because we want to make sure that these institutions don't fall. We know we need something to prop them up. And that's the wrong motivation from my perspective. The motivation and ultimately that the love of Christ can be displayed and all will know that Jesus is Savior. That's the motivation. And so what that looks like is not necessarily the institutions that we that have done that in the past. It might look different. Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy, it only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. You know what else would help us out? Share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network. Tell them how much you enjoy it and let them know that they should be listening as well. If you are new here, welcome. If you want to dig deeper, find us on social media at Shifting Culture Podcast, where I post video clips and quotes and interact with all of you. Previous guests on the show have included Onia Ukuwabi, Jamal Williams, and Timothy Paul Jones. You can go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Dan Christ. Dan has given his career to Christian ministry with emerging generations in international and domestic contexts. He served in ministry in New Zealand for 15 years with Youth for Christ, Knox Presbyterian Church, and Hutt International Boys School. When they returned to the U.S., Dan and his wife Cindy and their four children settled in Bristol, Tennessee, where he served as professor of youth ministry and dean of the School of Missions at King University. Dan's book is A Church for Everyone, which he co-wrote with Ephraim Smith. Dan and Ephraim are passionate about the church and want to ensure that emerging generations find the church to be the example to the world of genuine community and context for spiritual nurture that God desires it to be. Dan and I have a conversation about how churches can better engage emerging generations and become more just and inclusive faith communities. Dan discusses his experience ministering in New Zealand and the U.S., and he emphasizes the importance of understanding one's community, being intentional in serving others, and working together across denominations. We also get into insights from Dan's research on what young people value in churches, such as authenticity, action on justice issues, and community. Join us as we figure out how to engage emerging generations and become justice-oriented, multi-inclusive communities of faith. Here's my conversation with Dan Christ. Dan, welcome to Shifting Culture. Really excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'd love to hear a little bit of your story of, uh, yeah, your relationship with Jesus, uh, your your time in New Zealand, going going there. What, what brought you to New Zealand and why, why do you love Jesus? You know, I guess with most of us in life, they're all kind of wrapped up together, right? You kind of your loves for the Lord kind of leads you places that you think, how on earth did I get here? And, you know, you, you look back and you go, wow, that was completely unanticipated, unexpected. But here we are and, and uh, kind of grow and develop into the person that God, you know, designed, created us to be. And you think, huh, you know, had I made these choices, yeah, had I thought about them in advance, I probably would not have ended up where I am. But because we're, we allow ourselves to be led, it just opens up all sorts of doors. So, I mean, a short story that I, I love Jesus because the faith that my my mother in particular shared was kind of bestowed to me in such a, a vibrant, real, genuine way that there was never any doubt in my mind that that this relationship that she had with Christ was absolutely real. Uh, to the point that it sometimes frustrated me. You know, we... We, we, she was a single mother, two boys, um, you know, and we, you know, money was tight. I mean, it was, it was difficult for us. There were times we lived on the East coast of the time, Pennsylvania, and there were times we didn't have enough heat for the house and have a little kerosene heater and there'd be ice on the inside of my 
my window in my bedroom sometimes in the winter. And the car wouldn't start. She'd get frustrated and she'd, all right, we're going inside. So we'd go, you know, have to go somewhere, go inside. And she'd say, all right, let's pray. And she'd get us together and holding hands and pray. She'd say, all right, let's go. And she'd get up and the car would start. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I'm like, no, that doesn't count. We just need to go to a mechanic. She says, we got a mechanic. We're good to go. Which, again, is just fast. And again, to this day, she's in her 80s now. Still, very much that kind of thing. That I know this is what God needs or God desires from us. Let's let's do this thing and, and you know complete faith. And the journey to New Zealand was kind of tied up in that. You know, I, I again my own desire. I had been interested in law enforcement and all that kind of stuff for a long time, and had shadowed some police officers and went to to study and thought law enforcement, FBI, something like that. But in my community, where I grew up in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, so a little little old steel town that's you know the steel mills all shut down and all that kind of stuff. And had never experienced any, you know, I had went to church and had the youth group and that stuff, but I went to college and there was, I kind of played guitar sort of, and I played guitar for a university one time and these people come up and say, hey, we need you. I was like, what do you need? You need me. So, this thing called Young Life. So I got involved in Young Life. I was just playing guitar and it just kind of opened up doors and I realized, you know, I had a passion for, I mean, I was still a young person myself, but just kind of thought maybe God is calling me to be a fence at the top of the cliff rather than the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, you know, kind of picking up the scraps. Let's kind of prevent people from getting to the point where they need law enforcement. So I, I transferred, I went to Eastern university, which, you know, Duffy Robbins, Tony Kemple, all those guys. And, and again, continued to grow in my understanding of who God was. And it was a great, it was a great time and a great place to kind of nurture that faith. And again, with mentors, like, like Duffy Robbins and, and others. It was fantastic. Got fully involved uh, in Young Lives there. Newt Hetrick was the area director and again, a real man of God and discipling. And then kind of, uh, I guess Tony was at that time, Kim Polo was at that time speaking all over the world. And yeah, I guess he had some kind of speaking engagement in Australia, New Zealand, something like that. And people in Youth for Christ in New Zealand heard him and thought, we need some help. And Tony said, well, we've got a youth ministry degree, you know, at school. So come. So these Kiwis came and I honestly went to this, to just talk to these guys because I wanted to hear a Kiwi accent. That was my motivation. But they said, Dan, we, we think you're a fit and we'd like you to come, come for a year and, and see what happens. And so I graduated and left a few days later to, to go to New Zealand again. This is, I'm old. So this is, this is late eighties. So I left. Reagan was still president. There's no internet. There's no cell phones. A phone call back home to my now wife with my girlfriend a year behind me or my mother was $3.70 a minute. And I'm on, you know, I'm on support. I raised support for this. So there weren't a lot of phone calls and I was terrible at letter writing. It was, it was tough. Yeah. So I ended up, I went for a year, worked for Youth for Christ, lived in home for at-risk uh, boys for a long time. Uh, I had been, again, I was a suburbanite, so, you know, mostly uh, middle-class youth ministry kind of experience, but this was something totally different. It was a new culture and then new cultures and living in, you know, home for at-risk, you know, street kids and that kind of stuff. And it just opened my eyes. And, I, you know, so the year finished and I went, I came home to the United States and convinced my wife, well, let's get married and let's go back for another year. She's like, well, that sounds fun. And we lived there together for 17 years. And just all our children were born there. It was just a fantastic experience. And uh, again, I was a pretty typical middle-class kid in the United States. And, you know, I love the U.S., but living overseas for that length of time certainly transformed my thinking and my understanding, both of my faith and my own culture and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that, my faith was a culturally conceived faith because it was genuine, but certainly over there, it it was different. And it kind of it made me kind of connect to my faith in a different way than than I had in the United States, just observing things differently and, and experiencing things differently. And, and it connecting with other people who had a faith that was also genuine, but very different than my own because their life, their experience, their worldview was completely different. And it just, it, it just continued to, mold and shape me and left there 
I was in these, we were in New Zealand for 17 years and then got a call to, to teach, to run direct, do what Duffy Robbins did in Eastern at King University, which is a small Presbyterian school in Bristol, Tennessee. And so I was, I was training others to be pastors and did that for about 15 years in Bristol. And so all those experiences kind of led to, you know, me thinking and writing and, and studying about emerging generations and just have a passion for young people in particular, those in emerging generations and their connection, not just to the, the physical tradition of church, but to a genuine relationship with Jesus. And, I, and so understanding that as our, in the United States, our culture shifts, um, there are some things that potentially the church can and maybe should be doing to help young people make stronger, better connections. And so that it's a lifelong kind of thing. Some of the stuff that you wrote about in the, in this new book, A Church for Everyone, is based on some of your research that you did for your PhD, right? And how did you connect with Ephraim to start to write this book? Um, and what is your goal? What was your goal setting out? So again, initially the book started out as dissertation, but it's it's which would make it seem like the book is academic. It's one, I'm not a great academic, so it's not academic. It's a relatively easy read. But it was basically, again, me trying to, my passion or what I felt called to was connecting emerging generations to the church in a real and by the way. We, we keep hearing this in, in, the, in the ethos, this idea of the nuns and this growing group of nuns. Like, you know, 20%, 30% of the emerging generations are nuns. They're not wearing a habit. They're not Catholic. It's I mean N O N E S, right? They they have no no identified faith, uh, or certainly not a traditional faith. And so, as I'm hearing this, I'm kind of asking questions and wondering that. And so, it began to that was what my research was based on. And some of that research, again, this is just an academic exercise at the time. I interviewed a whole bunch of people who were doing ministry, and one of those people that I interviewed was Ephraim. And then completed that and thought, good. That was hard work and I'm done and let's move on to the next thing. And my editor, who was a friend of mine, and then my dissertation supervisor was like, this, this, more people need to read this than just us. And I was like, really? That seems like work. <laughs> and I'm really done, you know? I finished my MDiv and then went straight into my, my uh, demon. And so it was like six years of, I haven't seen my kids in six years. What are you thinking? So... But we kind of floated it out there and somebody decided they wanted to pick it up, but they just thought, Dan, you, this is a, a really strong book. It'll be even stronger if we put another voice in. And so they, uh, they reached out to Ephraim and Ephraim's like, I'm on board. And so the two of us collaborated then. Some of the, the information and content of the book comes from his writing and his, because he's in Sacramento. So he's got it in a very different context than I am. And then some is, is mine. And so together, it just makes for a, a broader understanding. So his is his input is a lot of thinking about justice-oriented kind of issues. And that's something that the emerging generations are very passionate about. And so they're they're wanting to see, you know, is the church doing what it what it espouses to do? Is it making a difference in the communities and making a difference in the lives of people? So that was kind of his area and and my areas again, particularly young people, but also I was at the time, like I said, in East Tennessee, Bristol, Tennessee. So I'm in a county that is 96% Caucasian. So when we think of diversity, that like ethnic diversity was almost an impossibility. You know, the the campus that I was on was much more diverse than the rest of the, the county, but the church that I worshipped in was not very diverse because it couldn't be unless we sabotaged the, the one or two local African-American churches. And you guys can't operate anymore so that we can be ethnically diverse. That was never going to work. But I, again, as I talked to students and as I continue to read and research, I realized that that there was a whole lot, uh, there were a lot of people living in our surrounding area of our congregation that were diverse in other ways other than just ethnic ethnicity. And they also weren't connecting to our church. And what were those things that were different? And what are the things that, you know, the, the unintentional walls or barriers that are, that are individual congregations put up that says, these are the people that belong here and you don't. And so that that's kind of the question that we began to wrestle with and ask. And so hopefully we've addressed some of that in this book, Church for Everyone. So then what are some of those barriers that 
basically wall up other outsiders and say, you don't belong. We only, only these types of people belong in the in this church. What are these barriers? So, so you're likely, you probably have heard 1963, Martin Luther King says, you know, at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the United States. And so he's obviously, they are specifically talking about racial segregation and we know and okay. And, and what he stood for, for and, and what the, the arguments were at that time. Well, you move on from there and you think this generation, so the ones that are born from 2000 on in the United States and actually in the other parts of the Western world are going to be the most diverse generation ever. You know, they're saying by 2035, somewhere between 2035 and 2050, Caucasians are no longer going to be a majority. They're going to be the largest minority. Right. And so that, that we get, we grow increasingly diverse. But for emerging generations, diversity, whether it's ethnic diversity, whether it's uh, uh, educational diversity, whether it's um, social standing, all that stuff, every other aspect of their lives in school, in their sports, in their uh, other their activities or music programs, when they go to college or university, when they go to a job, all of those things. Because that's the generation, that's a much more diverse generation that's everywhere. And then on Sunday morning, you're looking and go, why, why is this context so different than every other aspect of my life? And so unintentionally, I think that the church is communicating something to them that I don't think the church desires to communicate. And that is, this is an exclusive area. Um, and I don't think that's any, what any of us intend, and it's certainly not what I believe that God intends for the church. And so that's going to, that's the diversity that we see. And, and so they're, they're much more fluid in that than we are and much more comfortable in, in that, that aspect in that way. If the church is communicating that this is an exclusive thing and not inclusive, what are some steps that the uh, church desires to be more inclusive that they want to see that they know that hey the gospel is for all nations it's for everyone we want to be inclusive and be oriented towards that what are some steps that churches can do to start to move that direction the steps for Ephraim and his church in sacramento and the steps for me and my little church in bristol tennessee are not going to be the same because it's a completely different context Right. And so rather than kind of formulate and say, all right, any church that wants to be diverse, here are the things that we do. Um, essentially, we begin by asking some questions like, OK, this is our neighborhood. Who lives in our neighborhood? Draw a circle on a map of a mile, a mile and a half. Said, Who is here and how can we serve them? So it's not necessarily about us and making sure that people uh, of every, you know, in our neighborhood darken our door and are here for worship, but actually that feel that like the church is a vital part of their lives, even if worship is not something they participate in. Because again, we communicate uh, the love of Jesus in a whole lot of different ways. So I'm here now in, in Roswell, Georgia, which again, is much more diverse than Bristol, Tennessee, but the church that uh, I've been called to is not particularly diverse at least not ethnically. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. I mean, there are some very strong, vibrant churches for, you know, we there's a Hispanic congregation that meets in our building at the same time. And, you know, the, there's a language barrier for them to come and worship with us. So that's a challenge. There are some very strong African-American churches within, you know, walking distance of here. And their worship style is completely different, and that's fine. But what our desire is that anyone that drives past this church sees us as a vital component in the community. Like those people, they open, you know, this, this facility is open for, we have, you know, basketball programs that are here regularly that have not affiliated with the church, but people are here to use the facility. You know, there are lots of nonprofits that use it for educational purposes or all that kind of stuff on a regular basis so that there's opportunity for people, not only to use the facilities, but for our congregants, the people who worship here to serve and mix and mingle and again, be the, the hands and feet of Christ in that context. And so it starts with questions like, who are we, who lives in our neighborhood and what are their needs and how can we serve them? 
uh, a guy named Daryl Gardner, who's a friend of mine in New Zealand, and he's an Anglican priest. And he's an Anglican priest in the Kapiti Coast in New Zealand. And he talks about, he is the, the priest of a parish. And that's the idea that we're trying to get back to in terms of a church. Like a parish is, you know, that I am the priest of this parish, even if these people don't don't worship here, or even if they don't even have a faith. They see me as a spiritual leader in some sense. So when it comes time to wedding, I, you know, to pro- promote a wedding or do a service together, I do premarital counseling with them and and talk about the faith aspect and how important that is in a marriage. You know, when it's when it's there's grief, the sickness, or sadness, and so he says, I serve this entire community in a whole lot of ways, um, and so I, and he's trying to empower the people in the congregation to see it in the same way. And so that's where that, that stems from that our congregations are, you know, it's a parish that we serve these people. And so a way to kind of influence and share the love of Christ in our neighborhood. So then what does it look like if you, we have a parish mentality that there are people that we're serving in our neighborhood in this mile and a half radius of our church Um, And if there are other congregations around there, what does it look like to start to hold hands and together and say, we're going to work on this together as the body of Christ and not just my individual brick church and your individual brick church? So think about if we're able to do that, what that communicates, you know, and how powerful that communicates. So again, we see, we hear it in the the political arena of the United States, you know, there's these guys and those guys, and they're just at odds with one another. And so, again, the nuns, particularly possibly others who don't have a, a strong church affiliation, drive up like our street. We, you know, it's a Presbyterian church here, right across the street, it's Baptist church, and then right across the street the other way is Methodist church. And they go, well, what, what's wrong with those people? They don't understand, right? They don't know. Like, why are there so many different churches? And well, they don't, the thinking is, Potentially, they don't like each other. They don't work together. And again, we want to eliminate that as much as possible. And it, you know, you and I, who are connected to the church, realize that that maybe, honestly, sometimes that's how it started. That's how we have some kind of some denominations for sure. And that's why in some towns there is a, a Baptist church on every corner because they kept splitting. Right? They're all the same Baptists. They just but they didn't get along with them. So there is some truth in that. But again, I don't think that's something we'd want to communicate. So how can we join together? What are what are the ways that we're not being territorial and ultimately concerned about maintaining our buildings or our style or all those kind of things and saying, this is the community that God has placed us in. This is where we worship. How can we join together? So let's hold hands. And so that means that the, the leadership in those churches needs to be intentional about that, you know, meeting together, gathering together. It means that the, however the church is structured, the eldership needs to be on board with that and and work to make that happen. And again, it's something that's got to be intentional because, I, you know, I work and it's pretty hard work to try and have relationships with my neighboring churches. And it's, you know, because this work, this this congregation is all consuming, right? You, there's, there's so much happening all the time. There's no time for all that. But we you know, wait a minute, you know, I, there's no time for not doing that ultimately again if we're trying to share the love of Christ and and communicate to the the wider community that hey we are all in this together and you can you know if you worship here or you worship across the street or whatever however you find faith we want to encourage that and so it's gonna I I like to think of it as kind of more of a, a kingdom mentality than a denominational or or even you know even non-denominational churches still have a uh, territorial kind of bent often. So we're just saying this is the kingdom in town. This is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is is very diverse. And God accepts the worship in all sorts of ways. It's tough. But again, as we think about emerging leaders, Christian leaders and that kind of stuff, helping them develop that mentality. And so, you know, the next generation is not very denominational. They don't care about that a lot. So they don't wake up and go, oh, I'm a Presbyterian or I'm a Baptist or I'm a, they're like, I have a faith. I'm going to find a community that helps me nurture that faith, whatever that looks like. So as you're researching uh, 
Yeah, the beliefs of, of young people and what they're passionate about, what they're what they want in a a church in a faith community. Um, what are some of the the things that they're looking for that would stand out in a faith community? Yeah. We need to discuss these things, but it's also risky to say, here are the things, right? Because one, every person is an individual and every person's different. Every area in the country is slightly different culturally and, and all that kind of stuff. And so there's some different things, but there are some general. So uh, they desire an openness and a genuineness, something that's that's real, that's tangible. So when, you know, when messages are communicated, that it's not just intellectual, it's like a you know, here's the theology or the intellect or the faith aspect behind it. Now, what does it do? You know, they, they tend to be people who gravitate towards action. Um, you know, Tony Campbell called that the praxis principle, you know, put it into practice and the faith comes behind it, you know, and, and as we work it out. So that's, that's one aspect. Uh, I think another aspect that they're very concerned about, I mean, this word, and that's, that's, uh, it's a difficult word currently in the last three or four or five years, but justice, you know, they have a, a, a specific idea about what justice is. And that's not necessarily always accurate, but again, seeing a community where people are, are focused on that and desire to kind of work out tangibly justice issues. So, you know, that has to do with that for some of them. It's, it's, ecological you know where they're worried about about the, the planet and how we care for the planet and what we do for that for others it's it's justice issues surrounding race or gender or all those kind of things and some of it's uh, more fluid than that but those kind of things are pretty again important to them they 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 don't desire again gen this is a generalization but they the, most of them gravitate away or move away from a congregation that seems to be I'm, I'm attached on a Sunday morning and then I, the rest of my life is com disconnected. You know, I'm stuck, you know, it's that the habitual kind of worship and doing the things and dressing up or however we do it. And then and it has no tangible connection to any other aspect of my life. I don't know that's any different from when you and I were younger, you know, I, and the church has always been like that, but I guess for a long time, there was enough, particularly in the United States. There was just enough cultural connection and cultural need to be part of a church that we many people just kept it up. This this generation is saying, "I'm not going to keep it up just just for the sake of looking the part." I mean, you're looking at thirty percent or so that are nuns that they have no religious affiliation. Um, that the emerging generations are, are coming in, and there probably isn't going to there won't be enough people in those generations then to keep up what we have been doing in the church. So the church is going to start to radically look different than it had in the past because we don't have that. In what ways can we start to reorient the church in ways that faith will be thriving, institutions may not, but faith in Jesus and the body of Christ can thrive in different ways and areas and places? This is going to be very difficult. I mean, it's, it's going to be a tough transition, uh, particularly, again, in the United States. Most of the rest of the Western world has already experienced this. I, again, I lived in New Zealand for, for 15 years. 4%, 4% of the population consider themselves Christian, you know, and, and attend church regularly. You know, Australia is the same. England is the same. It's going to be tumultuous and, and difficult, and it's going to potentially feel like God has abandoned us or, you know, faith is gone and there's no people left. But uh, one of the people that I interviewed for this, your name is Mackenzie Neal. She was planting a church in the Tri-Cities uh, that was for basically emerging generations, you know, the inner city folks who, who again, felt disaffected from the church. And yet this church was vibrant and growing. And she said that, some of that is what she called a winnowing and that actually the pandemic was a, was a kind of a winnowing. And we've seen that, right? We know that there's, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, we did this all the time. And we, and we just don't anymore. 
but the ones that have remained are the ones for whom faith was vital. And so that means that, yes, some of our churches and institutions will end up closing, but hopefully, prayerfully, the ones that remain open are more vibrant. Having that kingdom mentality and saying, I, I, I continue to worship, you know, and, and God is still God. And God still holds all this together. And, you know, ultimately, when we think about making some changes and making some tough decisions and, you know, if it means kind of blending some separate small congregations to be more vital and active in a community, then what does God find faithful in this? And how can I express myself fully in my worship? And it might not look like what we did, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And it might mean, you know, my tradition, it might mean, okay, if we want to engage the next generation, we might have to get rid of some of the bells and smells because they don't, it doesn't, you know, all, all that kind of stuff might not work for them. I don't know. So we just kind of, again, being open to that, continuing to ask them, continuing to share with them the traditions that, that really matter to us and why they matter to us that we've kind of winnowed out and saying, this is why these are important. And even if you don't, as a young person, don't really understand or engage with it, this is why it's vital, you know, then hopefully they, they capture it and understand it and it's vital for their faith and development as well. So what's, uh, as you were interviewing Mackenzie, uh, in the Tri Cities and her her church was for the emerging generation and it was thriving. What were some of the things that she was doing that was making it thriving? They were very intentional about recognizing who was in the community and then trying to serve them and making it a safe space. Uh, There's a, a family there who had children on the autistic spectrum, and so that was, you know, the worship is a difficult place for for families like that, right? There's a whole lot going on, we, uh, particularly, you know, in, the, in a contemporary service, we got drums going on, so there's a lot of noise, and there's kind of movement and all that kind of stuff. So they actually recognized that, talked to the families, and then they dedicated like what they call a STEM area, like a, a, a hands-on tactile kind of area with some carpet and some things and some earphones and all that kind of stuff to say, it's fine. If this is where you need to be or you, where you need to be, because we welcome you in this space. Um, same with, with children, you know, and we know that children can be disruptive at times, right? And you're in the middle of a, you know, a deep point in, in a sermon and they're a baby whale or something like that. And you're like, oh, I just lost the moment. So kind of, um, recognizing that's part of reality, but making space for them. You know, there's uh, many other churches that rather they, they've given up on the, the junior church idea where, you know, you have them, they come for the, the children's message and then they're out so that we can kind of do the, the grown-up stuff many churches have said well we're going to gather them together and we're going to gather them in the back of our sanctuary or back of our place so that they're still here and engaged and hear it and we'll, but we'll keep them engaged in, in different ways so that the parents can be free to worship those kind of things they uh, in mckenzie's church again the, the way that they prayed for one another was was intentional um the way that she structured the service was intentional the types of music how we did music that it wasn't just uh wasn't just a passive event that somebody showed up to i watched this i sang a couple songs that's my only involvement and then i leave again but there was interaction and all that kind of stuff all of it again as much as possible to be engaged in developing community and then outside of sunday morning worship then how they gathered together in other ways to serve uh, to read scripture, to to care for one another when there were needs, all that kind of stuff was very intentional. It was a small, it's not a huge congregation. Obviously, the bigger you get, the more challenging that gets. Yeah, if you get big, let yeah, have some of them over here and, and one side doing it and gathering together and some of them over here, it's, it's all right. We can figure it out, how we can continue to be uh, intentional, move out towards our community. You talk a lot in your book, you talk about justice-oriented, multi-inclusive churches. Well, what for you, what does that mean for us? And how, how can we start to get to be justice-oriented, multi-inclusive? That idea of multi-inclusive, that, that's kind of a word that we coined, ultimately, recognizing that, you know, Ephraim's church and my church, in terms of um, multi-ethnic, were very different. But what were some other ways that we were needed to be inclusive? And again, thinking about 
educational, academic level, socioeconomic level, uh, gender, all that kind of stuff. How are we kind of including or excluding people? And, and what does the, what is God's desire for the kingdom of God? And so, again, in our reading, particularly, I look at the Old Testament, you think, here's the Old Testament, that Israel allied saw themselves as God's chosen people, right? That's an exclusive group. And yet consistently through the Old Testament, there are messages of inclusion all the time. It, right, right all the way back to, to the Ten Commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments that you'll keep the Sabbath. That's in there as, a, as an, ex, you know, an inclusive thing because it says you'll keep the Sabbath and that there's rules about you're not allowed to have your servants work. And you're not, you know, they need a day of rest as well, even though they're not part of your community. We want to care for them, and, and they need to experience justice as well. And so that that's where we begin to realize that, again, and that's just obviously moves down into the New Testament where it becomes even more clear and powerful. And so that justice and that multi-inclusiveness are kind of intertwined and blend together. So a lot of people in the West are experiencing the decline of church, uh, the institutional church is declining. Um, you're... You're working with emerging generations, young people, where they have less religious affiliation than before. Uh, what is giving you hope in the emerging generations? What do you see in them that will carry the flame of Christ into the world? Those generations just have so much, I have so much energy and enthusiasm and. And they, they do have a desire to make the world a better place, to, to be honest, to have integrity, to, to share all these principles of faith, right? All these principles that, that Christ taught. And so what the disconnection comes when they, they don't see the church as offering those things. But I have hope because I think ultimately the church does as as the manifestation of the work of Christ, I think the church is the best hope for the world. And so as we kind of help them experience those things and, and recognize, so as we become as a, as churches, as individuals, as a faith community, more inclusive, more intentional, more active and dynamic in ex expressions of our faith, I, I think they're on board and they're excited about it. And I don't know, you know, our hope is, your hope, my hope, everyone's hope is that there's going to be another great awakening. My fear is that some of that is because we want to make sure that these institutions don't fall and we only need something to prop them up. And that's the wrong motivation from my perspective. The motivation is ultimately that the love of Christ can be displayed and all will know that Jesus is Savior. That's the motivation. And so what that looks like is not necessarily the institutions that, we, that have done that in the past. It might look different. Kara Powell, in their book, Growing Young, talk about giving the keys to some of these these decisions to the next generation, you know? And so some of that is like, how, you know, here we are, we're the older adults who, this has been our experience, but we want to, we want you to have faith. We will work, walk with you, work with you, guide you as much as possible, but we are, you are now leading us. How do you reach your own generation? I think that's, you know, that's critical. And I, I have hope because I, you know, I, in this, this congregation, this community, I see it happening, that there are some emerging generations. And again, it's not just teenagers, right? It's those 40 and under there, there are, that are excited and passionate and faithful and, and wanting to see the love of God displayed and, and shared as much as possible. And that's fantastic. And yet they're doing it in a way that is more inclusive and they are willing to cross the street uh, in a way that we haven't before. And I get like, they're, cause they're not, they're not hindered by this denominationalism or, or all that kind of stuff. They're just like, Hey, we we're because that's been their experience in other ways. We're together in this. You have a faith and I have a faith, you know, in our, in our culture in, in the West and the United States in particular, there's that, that long time Catholicism versus Protestantism. Right. And it all, you know, when I, I wasn't alive then, but when Kennedy was, was elected, you know, that was a huge deal. Like we put a Catholic in as, in, as president. That's, that's craziness. Right. But that's for this generation, 
if, again, if you have a vibrant faith, if you practice it in the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church or the non-denominational church or whatever, that's irrelevant. The, the bottom line is where are the connections that we have? And, and we have a vibrant faith. However you express that is fine, but these are the areas that we want to serve together and are open to that. And this is exciting to see. What's the one one thing that you would love your readers to get out of your book? Yes, the, the one, again, I want them to be encouraged. The, this is not, again, it's not formulaic. It's not a book that says, hey, these are the steps to do what you do. I, one thing I'd love them to get out is to, to, to read it and feel like, hmm, well, this is what is happening in our neighborhood and how can we be multi-inclusive in our neighborhood? Who are the people that we are not, that are in our neighborhood that we're not serving, that, that don't feel a part of things? What are some, you know, asking some hard questions. What, what are some things that we are doing intentionally or unintentionally that are putting up barriers that maybe we need to not do anymore? And again, that's, that's a long process and it's, and it'd be a difficult discussion sometimes, but again, if we're, if we're open to that, I think we become more true reflections of, of the church that, that God ordained and God desires. And I'm excited. And I hope, and Ephraim and I hope we really, you know, we we'll put it together and we wrote this together in the hopes that. It'll move the needle some. It'll, again, make us more, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as churches, uh, better reflections of of God's love and yeah, and working together. And, you know, when, when all this kind of went down a, a few years ago, the pandemic and all the racial injustice and all that kind of stuff, this is in the middle of us writing. You know, it, it bothered me that political leaders and these people feeling this tension didn't go to the church and say, Hey, how do you guys do it? How have you guys worked on? It? Because we weren't ones that were providing answers. We should have been the model and everyone, all that went down. They should have gone, Hey, look in the church, they know how it's done. Let's go to them for advice. But that wasn't what happened because we're kind of behind the eight ball in that. So wouldn't that be great if we are the models for a more inclusive, more just, more caring society that I think God has called us to be. You know, people constantly refer to the church and they, oh, we need to be like those people in our politics, in our government, in our, you know, in our schools and all that kind of stuff. What that's, that's our hope. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's, let's hope. Let's, let's see it. Let's make it happen. Uh, Dan, a couple quick questions. One, if you go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give? Oh, man. Uh, I go bungee jumping because I never did. And now like, I'm going you never to did. I did I, it. So I know, oh, come on. New Zealand I, was yes. the, where it originated. I, I went it bungee was, jumping it, on the bridge, Kawarau bridge, where it started, where the yeah. first bungee In was happening. Time. And at the come time, on, you know, man. I was a poor, I was a poor <laughs> youth ministry person. I didn't have the, I was like, man, a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. But now, and now I'm like, I'm going back to, you know, like, I, I don't know if I could do it now. I, you know, I might lose. I might lose some teeth. You know, they're not as tight as they used to be. So I think, uh, yeah, take more adventures, be willing to do more things. But again, um, I, I'm amazed. So in my 21-year-old time, I don't know that he would listen to me. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, that's good. Uh, anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? Yeah. What have you, I, I was just thinking about that. Um, I've been reading some stuff on, I'm, I'm leading a, a group to Guatemala. I'm reading some more stuff about um, leading leading people into different cultures and, and that kind of context. I'm trying to think of the author and I don't have it off the top of my head, but there's some good stuff out there about, again, being intentional about uh, cross-cultural connections and all that kind of stuff and having them. My desire when I take this group is that they experience worship that's completely different their own and yet just as worshipful, you know, and if they have, a, you know, they won't understand the language. They won't understand a lot of, you know, what's going on, but God is still being worshiped and how exciting that is. If I could think of the author, I'd send it to you, but I, I can't off the top of my head. Sorry. Uh, you know, we, I, I run a missions organization. We have some people in Guatemala and, and some incredible things that are, are happening and you're seeing some of these things that we've been talking about this, you know, justice oriented, multi-inclusive and churches. I mean, and the people that we have on the ground the church looks a lot different than it does here in the West, but 
that Jesus is being worshipped and glorified and, and people on the margins are being lifted up and we're seeing an, a lot of incredible fruit uh, there. So yeah, you're going to have a good time in, in Guatemala. Well, Dan, thank you for this conversation. It was, uh, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. I love that we got to to talk about the emerging generations, that there are a bunch of non-affiliated uh, people, some nuns, but there is some hope that they they love the world, they love others, that they don't see denominations, uh, they see authentic faith, and that is experienced and lived out and embodied, and that we can be churches that do that as well, that we could be justice-oriented, multi inclusive churches, then we can start to walk in those ways that we're here. We're a church for everyone. So thank you for this conversation. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts so you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram so if you want to connect, interact. Uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.